folks, I'm Heather and this is Recently Seen Reading and I thought I would try to get back on the booktube filming routine by doing um, a quick little video to help me frame my reading from last year. I don't want really though to talk too much about statistics. I spend, I think, a bit too much time thinking about numbers of books read, numbers of books left to read and that kind of thing. Um, and I'm trying to step away from that a little bit this year, 2022. So I thought maybe the book uh, Postscript tag might do the trick. This is a tag that uh, circulates around Booktube in December usually, a little bit in January. And it was started by Adam at Memento Mori. And I'll put the usual details down below. So the first question in this tag asks, what's the longest book you read? this year and what's the one that took you the longest to complete and for me that's one book that's Lucy Elman's Ducks Newbury Port which I started in December of 2020 and put down in January of 2021 on the 6th of January to be specific the day of the uh, events in Washington and I picked it up in late December 2021 because I wanted to finish it and I did finish it um, I think this was pretty much an uneven read for me. I understand what Elman was, I think, trying to accomplish in the book and what she was trying to communicate about the, the state of the United States and about um, what life is like for middle class, lower middle class Americans. But all the time that I was reading, I kept thinking about um, how much shorter it could be. And the comparison I kept making um, would be a comparison to Tilly Olson's I Stand Here or Ironing, a short story that accomplishes much of the same um, point, I think, as Elman is getting at. So, not the best book I read in 2021, but certainly the longest and the one that took me the most amount of time to get through. Second question. What book did I read this year that was outside my comfort zone? So were there a handful? Um, one was Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, which was published in 61, 1961. And this was outside my comfort zone because I know shockingly, shockingly little about um, the Algerian independence movement. And because I struggled at times with the way that Fanon um, has an intersection between Marxist politics and psychoanalytic theory. That's not a, an intersection that I've, I've read very deeply and so that was outside my comfort zone. But I'm very glad to have finally read um, that bit of Fennel. I suppose there will be more Fennel in my future. But that one was the most outside my comfort zone in terms of reading non-fiction, I think. Um, another one outside my normal reading range would be Hanif Ab Abdurraqib's um, let me get the title correctly, A Little Devil in America Notes on, in Praise of Black Performance. And this is um, a collection of essays about, as, as the subtitle says, black performance, so dance and music, intersected with, with memoir. And I don't read much about music, so this is well outside what I would normally read. But the prose is so beautiful um, in the, the way that he combines discussions of music and black culture with a memoir I found very striking and it's on my to be reread in 2022 list I hope. The next question asks how many books did I reread in 2021? I always talk about rereading but I don't usually get to it. I read reread um, seven I think. A handful of Dorothy L. Sayers and a couple of Beryl Bainbridge and um, Sarah Schulman and uh, Leibowitz, I think, would be what I made. And the favorite reread of 2021 was Beryl Bainbridge's Another Part of the Wood, which is the story of three couples and an adolescent and a seven or eight year old boy who go to a farm with um, weekend holiday um, lets um, over a long weekend, maybe more than two or three days. And in kind of classic Bainbridge style, bad things happen and you can see them coming. 
um, and bad things are happening in the relationships and it all unfolds, some of it in the way you'd expect it to, but some of it very much not in the way you'd expect it to. And the prose is so tight and controlled and compact, so that would have been my favorite reread of last year, um, The Barrel Baying Bridge. So the fifth question asks, uh, what book have you read for the first time this year that you are hoping to reread in the future? And for me that's Anne Petrie's uh, The Street, which came out in 1948, I think. It's the story of a, a young black woman who moves with her six or seven year old son into Harlem. She's moving away from a husband who she's just divorced and is working very hard to improve her living conditions and her economic circumstances. And the book, in the way it covers her, the obstacles she's facing and the things that happen to her and the things that, that she does is incredibly fresh for a book that was written um, more than half a century ago. And the, the plot and the storytelling is, in, I found, incredibly propulsive. So I'm, I'm looking forward to rereading that one. It's the first Anne Petrie I read um, and very, very impressed by it. It's not a happy read, though, but very impressed by it. Um, let's see, question six down here on my screen. Favorite single short story or novella read in 2021? I don't particularly enjoy short stories, so I read collections of short stories um, from time to time to try and kind of expand my range. To, you know, work against the things I don't necessarily like. Um, so none of them s kind of stand out. The closest thing to a novella um, that I read that I would recommend is The Diary of Duck Sung Wong. And this is not quite a novella. It's a diary kept by Duck Sung Wong from the, the time he was in his early 20s and living in China through his time working on the Canadian Pacific Railroad in British Columbia, through to his um, establishing and maintaining a, su a successful business as a tailor into the 1930s. It's um, a remarkable account. It's very short and it's very fragmentary. It only survived because his granddaughter included parts of it in a paper she wrote as an undergraduate at university. The original manuscript itself um, was lost in a fire. The diary is unique. There's nothing else like it in Canadian historical record that captures what it was like for the men who came from China to build critical parts of the Canadian physical infrastructure. It's a point of view that you, you don't get directly anywhere else, as far as I can tell. So it's a book with a fair amount of critical apparatus around it, lots of footnotes, lots of explanation, but it's a short little thing and I would count it as a novella and if you ever come across it, um, it's worth rereading. It's very vivid. Number seven, Mass Appeal, a book I liked and would recommend to a wide variety of readers. Um, in terms of novels, probably Zoe Whittle's The Spectacular, which came out last year but was largely overshadowed by Detransition Baby, I think, um, a much bigger press push on the American novel rather than Whittle's Canadian novel. So Whittle is telling the story about um, chosen families across ooh, two, three generations of women, mothers and daughters. And the novel moves from the 1970s and commune culture in Canada through um, rock and roll and music in the 70s, 80s, more the 80s, into the gay and lesbian scene in San Francisco in the early 2000s um, and it's a book about chosen families in many ways and about repairing families that have broken down um, largely over conflicts over um, gender roles essentially I think is the way I would describe it. It's an interesting novel. Um, I think it's it's not as um, a snappy read as, as Tori Peterson's Book, but I think it's actually probably a slightly better novel. So that one's one I would recommend if you're interested in stories about mothers and daughters and about gender variation and how um, the politics around that have changed over two and a half, three generations. A specialized appeal, a book I liked but would be hesitant to recommend to anyone else 
or to just anyone. I've got two here. Uh, the first one is Rachel Holmes' Sylvia Pankhurst, Natural Born Rebel. This is um, a thousand page biography, nearly a thousand pages, slightly short, <laughs> shorter than Lucy Alman. Um, and it's the kind of biography that includes lots and lots of cultural history. So you'll get a little bit of history about Sylvia Pankhurst, then a little bit about um, the cultural context of the person who she's associated with at that period of time. That combination of focus on Pankhurst, then um, broadening out to the cultural surround can fill in a lot of gaps. Um, and Pankhurst was um, one of the two Pankhurst daughters. Christabel is the daughter who's, who's better known than Emmeline, the mother's probably better known than Sylvia Pankhurst, who was much further on the left than either her mother or her sister and was sustainably on the left. Um, long involvement in left politics, anti-fascist, um, ended up living and thriving in Ethiopia at the end of her life. The problem with the Holmes biography um, is that it needed an editor to rein it in a little bit, and it needed a better editor. There are sections in the book, particularly in the first third, where it's been poorly proofread and the editor's notes to Holmes are still included in the text. And that's a shame because it's the kind of book that's unlikely to ever be freshly, uh, freshly set in print. So those kind of um, poor proofreading um, results are going to follow that book through time. But if you're curious about Pankhurst and about her, the culture she lived in and the people she was associated with, it's a it's an interesting read. The other one that's probably a more satisfying read is Sarah Schulman's Let the Record Show, A Political History of ACT UP New York. Um, this one came out last year. It's also long. This is the result of a project Schulman's been working on for about, oh, I'd say 10 years. It's based on the interviews of about two or 300 people, the survivors of the AIDS epidemic, um, about their experience in ACT UP New York. All of the interviews that the book is based on are available, op available openly on the web, and so are the videos that accompanied the, um, the interviews, which makes it a really interesting exercise to go through and read a chunk of the book and then go and look at the source material. Really interesting kind of experience, especially if you're interested in the way oral histories are done. Um, the book is not a kind of a continuous narrative. It, it circles back on itself and is chunked up in interesting ways, largely because Shulman is, is interested in telling the story of underrepresented people in ACT UP New York. So people of color and women in particular and she's interested, I think, in representing conflict and how organization can help move through conflict to meaningful action. She's not particularly interested in, and ACT UP wasn't particularly interested in, um, in Schulman's telling of it at least, in perfect consensus. They were interested in action that propelled um, the cause forward. So I would recommend that to anyone who's interested in the history of the late 80s and early 90s and interested in the um, history of the anti-HIV movements and the, the tremendous effort it took to get a straight um, bureaucratic administrations to attend to the very real scientific and medical and social needs of people infected with HIV. The ninth question here is to asks you to reflect on your year as a bookish content creator. I'd say mine was pretty lackluster, um, didn't produce much content, read a lot, read a lot, watched a lot of videos, enjoyed a lot of videos of the people who've been able to maintain and grow their channels. I have great admiration for that. But this was the year that, that um, work and the pandemic ate my brain. I work in an academic library and much of what we do had to be reinvented in order to shift everybody from working in buildings and supporting students and faculty in physical buildings to supporting them working from home in all kinds of different ways. And that was a challenging year. So it ate my brain and I had very little energy left for making video when I spent about half the year figuring out how to provide professional video to faculty and students at a cost the library could afford. Um, so a lackluster year. I'm hoping for a little bit better in 2022. 
but we're shifted back to online again and um, who knows what the end of January is going to bring. The tenth question here asks me to tag someone. I suspect there are very few people watching and that's okay, but if you are and you would like to do this tag, please do it. Um, that's all for now. Bye-bye.